Uh, welcome to our talk, um, Profile Optimized Repeat, One Call is All You Need. Uh, my name is Valentin. I'm a software engineer, machine learning engineer at Scalable Minds. We are based in Potsdam, in Germany. Uh, our customers are research facilities that are interested in, in understanding the brain, and we help them by reconstructing neurons from electron microscopy data. Hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan. I'm also a software and machine learning engineer working at Diagnostics. At Diagnostics, we are transforming biomedical data into insights, for example, microscopy images of cancer tissue as insights for pathologists and cancer researchers. You can find me on Twitter or have a look at my um, still slightly empty blog. <laughs> so we both have a pattern in our jobs that we've seen from time to time. And we're analyzing biomedical data, microscopy images. Um, this analysis often happens in the cloud or on high performance clusters, and then we generate insights. So what happens is that the microscopes become faster, they become bigger, and we have more microscopes, more clients, and at some point you will see, okay, my analysis pipeline that used to work really nice now is too slow, or it runs out of memory. So we are out of time, we are out of memory. One of those two options, it happens to us multiple times in our jobs. Um, so one first reaction that you might have is, okay, what do we do? We scale our cluster, we scale our um, cloud machines, more machines, beefier machines. Well, maybe that's not the first thing to do. Maybe we don't scale up or out yet, but instead we just use one core. One core is all you need to optimize your workloads. So once you look at optimizing your workload on a single core, you can get improvements and those improvements will also pay off once you scale later. Um, this is work that you can use anyways. Um, parallelization needs resources, so those beefier machines, the more machines, they cost money, it costs time to set this up, to maintain, and also for some code, it might be hard or even impossible to just parallelize it and to scale this out even. So for example, if you have a MapReduce classical example, uh, the reduce step might be a bit harder to parallelize. So let's have a look at a practical example here. Uh, this example is based on the Scikit image tutorial. Um, so we see on the left hand side a uh, skin tissue and they train a random forest classifier to segment this uh, skin into different regions. And let's assume that we have at our hypothetical company a code basis that um, visualizes these predictions um, so that they look like at, at the right hand side. So we have a color for each class and then we modulate uh, the intensity based on the prob probability of the class. Um, so in our case, the uh, predictions are already there. They are stored on disk, and this is how they look like. We have a 3D array, so a 2D image, and a channel dimension uh, with four classes, uh, one channel for each class. And then we want to map that to a um, image that has the same 2D shape, but then three channels RGB to, to get our colors. The code that we already have and it's, still, and it's working, but it's not good enough, um, has two functions. The first one loads the, the data that is stored on disk. Um, we have a CSV file for uh, every class. So we uh, read one class after the other and then stick them together in the channel dimension to have this prepared for our next function that then maps these probabilities uh, to our output visualization. So first, we um, set up our class colors, so one color for each class, and initialize our output um, list. We then go through every row in our input image, and we have three or four um, loops, so the first one goes through every row, and then the second one through every item in that row, and then the third um, checks all the probabilities for that certain uh, pixel, and uh, we need the class index, or which class has the highest uh, probability and the probability itself, so that we can then, after um, 
select the right color, and then scale it uh, based uh, on the probability. We then append this then to our rows and append then the rows to our image back again, and this is um, our example. Throughout this talk, we will uh, start with this example, and it takes uh, 15 seconds for um, the input uh, we showed before, and it takes uh, 100 megabytes peak memory, and we uh, will profile and optimize and iterate on that, um, and we will show measures to take, uh, and they will advance throughout the talk, and eventually we end up with an uh, algorithm that is 100 times faster and needs just a tenth of the um, peak memory. But first, we need to profile and see where we should optimize. So before we start our profiler, let's look at what profiling actually is. So in profiling, we measure a piece of code um, to identify and analyze bottlenecks. And here we want to look at speed and memory bottlenecks. And why do we analyze them to mitigate later in our optimization steps? So as a heads up, this is different from benchmarking, for example, where you are interested in differences across time or machines. So the first thing we're looking in is time or CPU profiling. Here we are interested in where is my code slow, how slow is it, and optimally, why is it slow, because that helps to inform what we want to optimize later. For memory profiling, we look at high memory usage. Where does it happen again? How much memory do we use? And maybe also why? There's one important difference, in my opinion, between different profilers. And the one type of profilers are uh, instrumenting profilers, which is deterministic because each function or code block that I want to profile is um, instrumented by the profiler. So it adds hooks into my code um, that gives the information that I want, how long does it take, how much memory does it use, but those hooks come also with a potential overhead. And once you have those hooks and you also want to profile larger chunks around those hooks, um, you start to get inaccuracies because this overhead then is part of your program. You're mutating your program with a profiler while profiling it, which might give you false results or false impressions. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, sampling-based profilers, so those are statistical, and they peek into your program from time to time. They look at the state of your program and extract the information needed from it. This doesn't come with the overhead from the instrumenting profilers, but also for very brief invocations in your code, they might miss this, or um, yeah, just if you peek after your huge memory consumption and just before your huge memory consumption, you might miss this in between. But as long as the sampling rate is fine-grained enough or your code lines runs long enough, you get a good impression of your code. So yeah, for timing, this should be fine because we're interested in time scales anyways. For memory, you might miss some brief things here. In this code, we look at Scalene. Um, Scalene supports both CPU timing and uh, memory profiling, as well as also GPU. Um, it's sampling based, um, which is nice, especially for the timing profiles, and it has a visualization that is very useful here in this talk. Um, that's why we chose it. There are many more profilers you can use. Um, here's a list I compiled last year uh, on my blog. Um, those four here are my personal favorites. I really like PySpy, Memray, Scalene and Austin, they all have different pros and cons, um, just some tools that I personally prefer. So let's see how do we use Scalene now in our example. First, we have to import it to our uh, program that we want to profile, and then we uh, place a start and a stop right before and after our code we are interested in. And then to actually run the profile, we call Scalene with a few parameters. We want to shut it off in the beginning, so then it just starts where we want to profile the code exactly. Uh, we want to have the CLI output, and we are uh, in the beginning interested in the CPU prof profile only. We then pass um, the name of our Python program, 
And if we have an additional parameters for our Python program, we can add them um, separated by these three dashes. Um, so we have multiple versions of our program. This is why we have this parameter. Um, and we have different uh, data scales as well to uh, make sure we have a decent um, sampling time. So let's look at our profile for our first um, program. So this is how the profile looks like. We already know that it takes 15 seconds. Um, on the left, you see four columns, and on the right, you see the program we, we have. The four columns are the line numbers, and then three times um, our time, so the Python time spent, oh, the time spent uh, in, in Python, and then we have native and system. Native means that we are in some pre-compiled library, and system, system are often hints at I.O., for example. So um, we now see that we have basically two main parts where we spend time. The first part is at the top, where we spend almost a quarter of the time loading the data. And then we have the second part where we um, index into our class um, colors and then scale the, uh, the RGB values. So we will look at the first, um, the, the loading first, because it's a low-hanging fruit. Um, the CSV file we load is text-based, and our data is uh, floats that are, can be nicely represented as binary and can be easily passed in a binary format. So there are good two options, uh, two, two good two arguments. So it's uh, faster to pass, and it's, it takes less memory, uh, me less storage on disk. Uh, there are many different binary formats we can choose from. Uh, we use HDF5 here in our example, and we have a link down below to a website that lists or benchmarks different binary formats if you're interested in checking out that later. So um, we now have to convince our colleagues that they will store the uh, probabilities in, in, in an HDF5 file, and if we succeed, we can now um, read them um, with HDF5 and profile again, and we see that's much faster. Um, and it, even, it doesn't even um, appear in our uh, profile because Scalene uh, drops um, percentages that are below one, one, one percent point. So we still see that um, the majority of the time is spent in this tight loop. And um, the question now is, what can we do? And one answer is uh, vectorization. So currently, we are using Python types uh, to do our calculations. Uh, they are very powerful, but they come with an overhead. And if we can make the assumption that um, all our elements are float64, for example, and they're uh, one after the other in the memory, then we can write much more efficient code. And this is what NumPy does. So NumPy has NumPy arrays, and they implement a variety of different um, operations on them. So you can add them, you can multiply them. They have even more sophisticated functions like ArcMax Unique. And they do uh, fancy indexing, and fancy indexing we'll see in a minute. Um, NumPy at its core is written in C, so this is where it get, it's getting its speed from. So let's have a look at our code rewritten in, in NumPy. So we still get our probabilities uh, to our function, and then um, first we need the, uh, the, the predicted classes. So we use ArcMax. Um, you see that we do not have any for loops anymore, so we're working on each uh, array at, at one time, um, and the function is applied on all elements of, of, of each array. So um, we first get uh, the indexes for our classes, and then we still need the probabilities, so we do that along the channel dimension in both uh, times. We have our class colors, and then we do our fancy indexing. So uh, we have the indices, uh, the predicted classes, with the, which is a 2D array uh, with values between 0 and 3, uh, which then index into our class colors array. This will give us uh, what we need, uh, and that is a, 2D, a 3D array with our image and then the colors in the, in the channel dimension. We still need to um, scale that, so we use the probabilities we have. Um, but they are in a different shape. Um, so they do not have the channel dimension, so we add that uh, channel dimension with the NumPy new axis and then multiply those two. So this is done for every element in the RGB space, and then uh, we still 
uh, need to convert that to unit eight because the probabilities are in unit, uh, are float 64 and the resulting array will be float 64. So we need to convert this to comply with our interface. I really like NumPy because it's much more concise and let's see how it performs compared to uh, what we had before. So it's much faster. It's more than 10 times as fast. Um, and we can have a look at our profile and we see that we spent um, time in getting the, the classes, the class indices, and then again getting the probabilities for each class, and we spend time then converting this to, to U and 8. So um, let's have a look at what we actually do with memory-wise, because uh, we are now operating on arrays, and the intermediate steps are materialized, so we store them in memory. Uh, our input is almost 160 megabytes, and our output should be 15. And when we look at the profile, uh, at the memory profile of our program, we see that peaks at 350 megabytes. And we will focus on the peak uh, column on the left. So there we see that we um, load the data, 150 megabytes, and then we indeed materialize the different arrays. We see that for the predicted classes, almost 40 megabytes, but then it peaks uh, when we convert our uh, RGB um, image uh, to float 64 when we scale that with the probabilities. And this is then eight times the size we actually need. So let's uh, try to optimize this further. So we can uh, look for exactly the data types we're actually using. So um, here's a list of different um, D types we might use. They have they use different amounts of data and can store different amounts of uh, values. Um, and we can, besides that, do manual garbage collection, so we can get rid of um, arrays that are still in scope, but we don't need them anymore. And we can do something like un manually unrolling our loops um, to avoid broadcasting. This is a bit unfortunate because NumPy is very cool, and you can do broadcasting, and it's um, nice, but it comes with an overhead sometimes, and um, I find this surprising. So um, this is my, something you would you know, should also look out for. So let's, with this in mind, let's have another look at our program and rewrite it. So in the first line, uh, we still do our ArcMux, but we convert this to U and 8 because uh, we only have four different classes and do not need in 64, but which is the default for ArcMux. And then we save us some work do not do the max uh, calculation again, but just index with uh, the predicted classes. This is happening in the second line. And then we do not need the probabilities anymore, so we can get rid of it. Uh, so we mark this to be deleted for the GC. And then we can save again some memory when we convert the maximum probabilities uh, to float uh, 32, because that's uh, enough precision for what we need here. At the bottom, we see that we can unroll the loop and do not do any broadcasting with the max probabilities anymore. If you remember uh, a few slides ago, I had a, I need, had to need to uh, add this number new axis to make this work, but now I can um, skip the broadcasting and multiply each RGB value. So how does this compare? Um, when we look for the peak column again, uh, we see that our peak at 100 or which add, added a 100 megabytes um, in RAM is gone now, so that's cool. And um, when we look for the runtime, we are now three times as fast. Um, and we still have bottlenecks, we always have bottlenecks, but they are now mostly in converting the different types. So we traded off some runtime for um, more or less RAM. And what else can we do about RAM? So, we started out with a simple for loop over our arrays and now move to um, NumPy, which just uses the whole array at once and does all the computation steps, where you also have the whole array for all your intermedi intermediate steps. Um, can we do something in between, uh, avoiding the Python loops um, because, okay, they are slower, um, but not loading the whole memory completely? 
Um, why do we want to avoid that? Because memory access generally is uh, slow. So if you're <coughs> optimizing also not just for memory but also for performance, still look at your memory access patterns because those are typically costly. Um, in our case, we can map over each single element and this means we can also just map over subparts of our array, so we do chunking. And actually, we can also only load a single subchunk of our data directly from the start, so here in the bottom left, and then transform this as before array-wise with NumPy, and then store this into our large output results and just store the different chunks there. So how does that look like in code? At first, uh, we need to change our loading routine. For that, we have a small helper, get chunk slices, and this gives us slices along a single dimension for a specific chunk size. In our case, we chose uh, 1024. And then get chunk slices is a generator that yields the different slices. So the slice operator is just um, the object notation for um, start, uh, colon, end, as you might know it from normal indexing, and this is just an object you can pass around for that. Then we adapt our load probabilities that we had before. So we still open our file, but we don't load it all at once. Instead, we have two for loops nested, which gives us the slices for the x and the y dimension. So we have a 2D grid over our array, giving us 2D chunks into that. Then we read from our HDF5 file in the bottom line just this chunk, which works really nicely with HDF5 um, because it's, yeah, you can directly index into the whole file and it's very efficient. And then also here have a generator that yields back the slice because later when we have our result, we still want to know where it came from to write it into the correct location and also the array itself. So now our color coding uh, function, we actually don't need to change at all. We are still operating on an array, just a much smaller one than before. But the, um, the function that combines all of this. Um, before, this was just load probabilities and color code probabilities, that was it. Now we have a little bit more logic here. So in the third line, color probabilities equals NumPy zero. Uh, we initialize our output array that we need later because we need a place to store our output data in, and then iterate over the different chunks that we read from load probabilities, so we get the slice and the actual array. Then we apply our color code probabilities on this array and write it back on the position of the chunk slice into our output array and return this. That's it. That does the same thing as before, but now in a tiled fashion without iterating over each element uh, with uh, NumPy for loops but still using NumPy, but not on the whole array at once. So how does this compare? Um, before, in our example, we had uh, almost 2,000 by 2,500 pixels, and now we have this chunk size of uh, 1,000 square. And we have 10% more runtime. It's a bit slower uh, because of the tiling, but we save memory. And most importantly, our memory now doesn't grow as much with our input size also but you can now have larger input sizes, and at the moment in this example, we only scale linearly this output array, but even that you might optimize away if that's fine for your use case. So here we can really save memory, and if you want to save more memory, you can have smaller chunk sizes, you might have some other trade-offs compared to the runtime, but now you can do that. So again, why can't we use the element-wise iteration. And that is mainly because this for loop in Python uh, is slow in our case because, yeah, we iterate over each element in Python land that comes with an overhead, as said before. Can we get rid of the overhead? And the answer is yes, but not with uh, default Python, but we can use number. So in this bottom part, what you see again is we have our large input array. We don't do tiling for now. We skip that again. and we again transform each element, but not with a Python loop. And this transformation, we also try to do it as efficient as possible without using Python. And we can do that with number jitting. So what number does is it takes your Python code and compiles that 
um, with uh, C, C++, and has an efficient loop over your data. Uh, there are also alternatives. You could use Python, um, MyPyC, MedWorks, Scython. There are different options. Just what we choose here is uh, number. Let's have a look at our code, how this looks like. So in this case, um, the first thing you see is the number and JIT decorator, which is a shorthand for JIT with no Python mode that just enforces that we cannot fall back into Python mode and really forces it to compile the whole function. Um, then what you see afterwards is the signature of our function below. The output is the U and 8 array, three-dimensional, and the input is the float64 array, three-dimensional again. And this is just that we do the chitting at import time. Chitting means we compile at runtime. You can also make number um, compile ahead of time. That's also possible. And in this specific case, we compile at import time with this decorator where we specify everything for the function. If you don't add the signature here in the top, then you would compile on a, just at invocation time, and it would look into the actual array that you're passing to compile your code. Then if you look roughly through the code later, we have again three for loops. This looks very much like our Python code before. Um, basically, it's the same version again. You can also use number primi uh, NumPy primitives sorry, with number, but only a subset of them. And in this case, uh, this was much easier to write, and it's still as efficient. Um, one trick that we added here is, again, the loop unrolling, um, because also here in this case, we get a speed up from that. Um, apart from that, it's very similar to the Python code. So it, instead of iterating over the lists, we just use indices into our array here for x and y and index instead of returning the individual elements. So when you first write this code, it might not look exactly like this. Then number comes when you start it and will probably throw an error. That happens to me all the time. I try it with number because sometimes you forget, OK, this needs to be a u and 8. And number cannot infer as much things as uh, NumPy, for example, could. So uh, this casting to np u and 8, you need to do manually and yeah, there are similar things, but if you just read the number arrows careful enough, uh, then you figure out what to do here. Um, and it's quite doable. They improved massively over the last years. I'm very happy with that. Um, yeah. So how does this look like performance-wise? So we compare now against our NumPy version before, the non-tiled one, because tiling is kind of an orthogonal concept to what we do here. You can, tiling, you can do tiling still on top of that, but we leave that out uh, for now, or chunking, as we call it. Um, so with Numba, uh, we have a speed up from 300 milliseconds to 122 milliseconds, and we use less memory. That's mainly because our intermediate memory, again, is um, not needed because we just process now each single pixel from our input with the probabilities, then do all the calculations with um, getting the maximum probability, getting the index of the maximum, multiplying the class, and do all of that in this most inner loop, which now is efficiently compiled with number. And instead, before with NumPy, we did all of these steps array-wise, which is more inefficient overall. So OK, this is quite fast. This is very efficient. Can we do more? Yeah, we can go more uh, low level. So um, there exists a um, repository called PyBind11, which allows you to write C++ extensions for Python, which is quite cool, because it integrates very nicely with NumPy. Um, besides that, there are other um, advantages. So you can use existing high-performance code you have lying around in C++, so you can integrate that. Um, it gives you all the fine-grained control C++ has. So you can write your SIMD instructions. You can even do inline assembly. So there's basically no limit. And alternatives are PyO3, uh, where you can write your extensions in Rust. So how would a PyBand11 extension look like for this example? Um, something like this. So you can use... Um, Num uh, NumPy types, so you have, we re return a uh, NumPy array in the end, that's on the top left, and we take two arguments, um, two um, NumPy arrays uh, with the probabilities and the colors. Um, in the first few lines, uh, we convert these um, to raw pointers to get the maximum efficiency. 
And then again, we have our three for loops that are very similar to the number example. Um, one difference is here that we do not do indexing, but work on the raw pointers and increment them just one step at a time to make the prefetcher happy. And then in the end, uh, yeah, we have this loop unrolling again and write out into our uh, colored image. This is then returned back to Python land and we can um, yeah, work on this as if it's just a NumPy array. Uh, the cool thing is that there's no copying uh, if we use the right types. So uh, if we pass a float64 probability array to that function, there won't be any copies of the whole data, but there will be copies of the structure itself. That's quite cool. And uh, the question is, do we get any better than number? And we do a little bit. Uh, we still use the same amount of memory. And this example, the difference is not that much, but it's actually there. So when we scale up the input, um, the, the relative improvement is still there. That's great. Um, let's wrap it up. So as you've seen, we did a deep dive here with you. And yeah, from this uh, PyBind version, you can do more things. You can have your um, assembly in line code if you want to. Of course, there's no end. Um, but we'll uh, stop here for this talk and now zoom out a bit from this example again. So what we did is optimize our input program, um, which was the Python for loops from 15 seconds and 800 megabytes um, memory usage to our last version with PyBind. And we also combined that with tiling again. So there we come to 150 milliseconds and 80 megabytes again for the memory usage as we had with the tiling example before. And for all of those insights, we use profiling. So if you have slow code and you have a hunch, mm, maybe it could be faster, always turn on your profiler and have a look because just the gut feeling often is wrong. Um, that's at least my experience. Maybe have, have a better gut. Um, then the first technique that we used is look at I.O. Um, often you can change your uh, inputs if you have that in-house and have control over it. Um, that is very valuable. Then you can try to optimize this directly. Then we used vectorization with NumPy to change our Python for loops into NumPy array. Then we had different techniques to reduce memory usage. So we had those NumPy tricks with the d-types, with um, deleting our arrays by hand, and uh, this broadcasting trick that we did as well. Then we had um, tiling, chunking as a technique, and in the end, we went more low level with um, PyBind and Numba. And this you can repeat until you say, okay, I don't have more time now. <laughs> now it's actually time, okay to maybe scale out or scale up. Um, we spend time optimizing our code and we're confident that, okay, maybe the time we spend now doesn't pay off anymore. And then we can look into threading, uh, multiprocessing, and if you want to scale beyond one node, there's Joplib, Spark, Dask, Ray. There uh, have, has been a great talk about that yesterday. There are other talks about this. But still, um, one core is all you need to do profile optimize repeat, and in our opinion, that's the first step you should do before scaling, but still, scaling is a good idea afterwards. Um, some resources that we find nice uh, here at my blog again, then pythonspeed.com data science has a great overview, um, also profiling different speed up techniques, um, and calm code uh, is a nice overview of different libraries, also including uh, Numba, for example, or PyInstrument as a profiler. So thank you very much. And you can find our code and slides here on GitHub. This is also the QR code for it. Um, we'd be very happy to take a selfie with you and then look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice, nice talk. I mean, you managed to speed up even your talk time. So <laughs> now we have 10 minutes left for Q&A. There's a microphone in the front. I already see somebody there. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, maybe just an idea. You show in the profiling picture what actually after the first optimization, uh, mostly time spent in the system. 
My suggestion was as many about memory allocation, and you can prove above with, with different profiler, for example, Linux Perf, which also shows you what you're actually doing just memory allocation. And maybe that's just because you use these temporary arrays, NumPy arrays, and you use just only functions. So you create them and you destroy them on each function exit. Maybe just an idea to use a class to cache this array and to reuse it every time you proceed in a photo. And this will reduce also the uh, memory allocation. And as I remember on your profile picture, it was the most time consuming part. Just an idea. Maybe you already uh, use it, this trick. Um, yeah, I mean, this example is made up for this talk, uh, just for this talk. So, yeah, we also spent uh, some time optimizing it, but didn't go into all the details we could do with all the different versions. Uh, but it's a very good idea, yeah. And Thank you. since you mentioned perf, um, also, I think since Python 3.12, right. I think it's possible to use um, Linux profiler perf on top of uh, Python, which gives you nice insights into your Python code, plus additionally low-level um, invocations that you can now also trace with Perth nicely on top of Python. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, my question is about the profilers. You mentioned there were two types of profilers, the um, sampling one, and then there was another type. Do you sometimes have to use both types to see if you get consistent results, or if one of them missed something? Um, yeah, especially if you care about timing versus um, memory. So in this specific case, we use sampling because it's useful for timing. Um, also, whenever you saw memory versus uh, CPU plots, we profiled differently, one only for the memory access and one time only for the times, because if you do both at once, the memory access also takes some time, the profiling itself, so it skews your runtime results. Um, but in this case, the memory access is somewhat okay, but it varies slightly because it's sampling based, and as we said before, you might miss uh, memory allocations. For this example, it's good enough. But I would recommend for uh, memory to use a deterministic uh, instrumenting profiler, usually, and for time, a sampling based, if you have enough time in sampling. Um, because that, for sampling, you just care about time, and it gives you a good representation of where you spend time. Uh, it's just by the nature of sampling uh, on the time axis. And uh, for memory, you rather care about the exact amounts and exact allocations in the different points. And but you shouldn't combine those two usually. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, just for this specifically, we also wanted to have one single output of one single profiler and not mix this up too much. That's why we stuck to Scalene here. Uh, thank you for the, call, uh, the talk. Do I understand correctly about the efficient I.O.? Uh, you basically converted your input format to some binary format so that you get some benefit. Uh, and how did it help? Because when you convert it to some binary format, you need to still serialize it to memory, and that's probably taking a little bit, a little bit more time. Um, I don't know if I understood correctly. Why should we need more time with the binary format? Uh, because it's compressed, actually. Uh, for example, you mentioned some compressed binary formats, and if you uh, want, if it's plain JSON or XML, then you, you just parse it. It's already serial. It's already not compressed, but for example, if it's protobuf or it's other uh, yeah, binary true. formats, if you parse it, first you need to unpack it, uncompress it, and then load it into memory, and that's, I mean, I assume that yeah. would take more time. Yeah, true, if you compress, then, then you're absolutely right. And in this case, we did not do any compression, um, but it's still smaller if you uh, do not do a text-based encoding of your floats, yeah. However, here again, you're trading um, for uh, decompression CPU cycles with uh, disk or network or whatever it is where your data is stored access, which is way slower. So in many cases, if you have efficient compression and efficient decompression especially, then um, loading smaller data and decompressing it can be way faster still than having the uncompressed version. Um, there are a nice example of this. I know, yeah, for SAR definitely you can choose your compressor, for example, and play with it having an uncompressed version versus different compressors, and there are nice papers about this, exactly this question. Yeah. Thank you. 
Maybe one example for uh, JSON loading, I believe you can have libraries that expect a specific schema for your JSON and um, also parsing with this, you have more um, information about your input. It might not be a binary schema on disk, but still loading it with this information um, upfront is also faster than just parsing it as usual. Yeah. Hi, <clears throat> uh, thank you for the talk. I have one question about the data that you're processing. Basically the example was like numeric data and I'm wondering if you have any advice on like parsing and like processing strings, how to deal with this problem, speed up this type of code. To be honest, we don't have much experience with strings ourselves. Um, yeah. So the only recommendations I know basically is uh, checking the encoding. If you can have a, an efficient encoding, if you know, don't need full Unicode support, uh, that helps up front just also to optimize your data format on disk. If you have um, a maximum length, those are typical techniques you can use. Um, yeah, I think it should be um, a very conscious decision about um, arbitrary length strings or fixed uh, length strings. For example, SAR, um, I think, has support for both, if I'm not mistaken. And there you can play with those parameters, but beyond that, I'm not an expert myself, to be honest. Thank you. A good question. <laughs> okay, so are there any more questions? We still have five minutes. Otherwise, uh, you will get five more minutes, uh, yeah, grab another coffee or something, and uh, give it up again for Valentin and Jonathan.